Yes, let's talk about hockey. The show that journeys through the history of the sport of ice hockey, from its disputed origins to the game we see today. Of all the positions in the game of hockey, none have gone through as many alterations as that of the goaltender. The stories of the innovations brought to this position, whether in terms of equipment or style of play, are ones recounted by many with reverence and excitement. People love talking about the first goaltender to drop down to stop a shot, to come out of the net and play the puck, to wear a mask, to score a goal. It's always about the trendsetters, the firsts. But what about the lasts? The ones that hold on to a notion that was becoming obsolete, or those that accomplished something that newly enacted rules would prevent future generations from doing? Well, today we're going to look at a few of the goaltenders who can be counted as one of these. Nowadays, due to the system of rotating goaltenders and the demanding strain of the current NHL game and schedule, you will always see a team's goaltending duties split between two or more goalies during a single season. But this was not always the case. From the game's beginnings, up through the latter half of the original Six era, a team would have only one goaltender playing every minute of every game in a season for them. By the early 1960s, this system would begin to give way to the one we know today, until it disappeared completely following Ed Johnston's 1963-64 season with Boston, where he played in every one of the Bruins' 70 games, the standard length of the NHL season during that time period. Aside from not seeing only one goaltender between the pipes for a team, we also no longer see goaltenders sitting in the penalty box when they've broken the rules. Instead, one of their teammates must serve the time. But prior to the 1940-41 season, when a goaltender broke the rules, he sat in the box, leaving his team in the tough position of killing a penalty with a defenseman or a forward standing in the net in his stead. But before the new rule that kept the offending goalie on the ice was enacted, Lauren Chabot of the Toronto Maple Leafs was called for high-sticking Detroit Falcons forward Ebby Goodfellow on March 16, 1933, and became the last goalie to be sent to the sin bin to serve his sentence, while forward Charlie Conacher manned the net in his place. Eight years after it was regulated that penalized goalies stayed on the ice, Another rule change would alter the goaltending position, when the NHL began prohibiting goalies from being captains or alternate captains on their teams. This was done in response to complaints from opponents of the Montreal Canadiens, who complained that their goaltender captain, Bill Duran, left his crease to argue with the referee at strategic points during games, resulting in unscheduled timeouts. However, despite this, in 2008, the Vancouver Canucks appointed Roberto Lalongo as their team captain, a position he would hold for the next two seasons. But, since he could not be the team's official on-ice captain due to the NHL's rule, forward Willie Mitchell acted as Vancouver's official on-ice captain when necessary. When thinking of goaltenders, though, the first thing that comes to mind is the mask. And while many remember Jacques Plante beginning the trend of masked men in the net in November of 1959, few recall the last time a barefaced goaltender was seen at work in the NHL. That final occasion came on April 7, 1974, when Andy Brown appeared in net for the Pittsburgh Penguins in a game against the Atlanta Flames. Though Brown and the Penguins would lose to the Flames 6-3, when he skated off the ice, he became immortalized as the last maskless goaltender in the NHL.